Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Mark Rowe with uh, Siler here, and I'll start out with a couple of housekeeping announcements. So uh, the remote participants are muted, and uh, questions are welcome. You can type them in through the chat interface, and those questions will be read here in the room at the end of the presentation. And I also want to mention that we're planning to have a happy hour this evening in honor of the speaker, starting at 5 p.m. at the Arbor Brewing Company in downtown Ann Arbor. So we're pleased to have Galen McKinley here as the speaker for our Siler Glural Great Lakes Seminar Series. Galen is Professor of Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences and the Bryson Professor at the Center for Climatic Research at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Galen received her PhD in climate physics and chemistry in 2002 from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her work focuses on using quantitative methods to learn about coupled physical biogeochemical processes in the oceans and Great Lakes. Um, as an example of some of her recent work, I'll just mention a couple of papers here. Um, she recently authored a review paper on natural variability and anthropogenic trends in the ocean carbon sink in annual reviews of marine science. And she co-authored a paper on partitioning uncertainty in ocean carbon uptake projections, internal variability, emission scenarios, and model structures in global biogeochemical cycles. And that paper was recently highlighted in EOS. So I had a chance to talk to Galen at the Ocean Sciences meeting last February, and I was interested to see at that meeting, um, it was a major theme estimating the global ocean carbon sink, and Galen's been involved in, uh, in that modeling community as well as in the Great Lakes, so I wanted to invite her here to promote uh, exchange knowledge between the, the ocean and Great Lakes modeling communities. So today she'll be talking about uh, spatial variability and potential long-term trends in Great Lakes carbon. So I'll hand it over to Galen. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thanks for inviting me, and thanks to everyone who's here in the room, and the remote participants as well. I'm going to try to stay close to the mic here and use the this as my pointer, um, and uh, let me know if uh, maybe the people in the back can raise their hand if you can't hear me. Um, all right, so I changed my title just slightly, but it's uh, as, uh, as I had in the abstract. I want to talk about spatial temporal variability in Great Lakes biogeochemistry. Uh, and uh, the, as is indicated by this animation that's been running for Lake Superior, uh, the lake is, uh, the lakes, all the lakes are highly uh, variable in space. Uh, and we all know that, uh, but we, we need to think increasingly about how those physical variability in the lake connects and drives variability in biogeochemistry. Um, and we can use numerical models to do that. Um, quite effectively and once those models are validated with observations. As you all know uh, very well, there aren't enough observations as we'd like to have to fully um, understand the lakes. So the coupling of the observations with the models can be a very powerful way to extend our ability to understand what the lakes, uh, how they operate now, how they might be changing, and what we should expect for the future. <clears throat> So here's just one example of biogeochemistry being spatially heterogeneous. This is CDOM absorption from the CWIFS mission, averaged over the whole period of the CWIFS mission for each season in Lake Superior. And CDOM is an indicator both of riverine inputs to the lake as well as uh, a product of biogeochemical, uh, of, of biological production. And so we have greater CDOM in the south shore, greater CDOM near the major river mouths, and uh, also a seasonal cycle in that CDOM. So for example, um, we can see that there's uh, this um, increasing CDOM in the near shore here on the south shore, and then this, this high CDOM starts to get swept off into the open lake in the spring and summer, uh, as, as well as in the fall, uh, mixing is also going to affect those patterns. So this is one example of biogeochemistry being spatial heter spatially heterogeneous. Of course, our current stressors also have significant spatial structure. So uh, the Allen all analysis that combined a whole bunch of different stressors to the lakes and mapped them spatially across the lakes here is shown 
um, just the, the total number of stressors above their mean level. Um, and the central point of this um, map is to show that the Lakes Erie and Ontario and the coastal part of Lake Michigan are particularly highly stressed from anthropogenic effects, while the open water of Huron and much of Lake Superior is tend to be less stressed. Um, but even within a Lake Superior, there's clearly a lot of uh, variability from a relatively little low level of stress to a high level of stress along a transect here in the western arm or at really in any place in the lake. It's not equal. Um, and if we also look at something like harmful algal blooms that um, you, many of y'all I'm sure were involved with these studies uh, uh, for the nice a picture from Michalak et al. 2013 showing this harmful algal bloom in um, Western Lake Erie. There's clearly a spatial structure there uh, that if we can understand how um, the inputs occur to the to the to the lake, how they're processed in the lake, we might be, do, be able to do a better job of predicting uh, uh, the, the harmful algal bloom and the impacts on say drinking water quality. Finally, physical change is also happening in the lakes, as we all know. Um, and this, uh, because physics really is the environment upon which the biogeochemistry sits, this is going to drive uh, biogeochemical change. So this is from Mason et al. 2016, a trend of the seasonal ice duration uh, for the past several decades in days per year. And you can, and here the um, pink, uh, orange, and yellow are the highest trends. Uh, and you can see that the trend in ice duration is actually greatest up in Lake Superior, it, with the gray is no trend, lesser in the more to the south, and has, a, again, a significant spatial structure. Another plot from that same study is the trend in summer wa water temperature from a shorter period here, 94 to 2013, in a de degree C per year. Uh, also showing uh, greater trends in summer water temperature in um, the eastern part of Lake Superior, but no trend in the western part of Lake Superior, and similar variability in those trends in the other lakes. Um, and this is likely related to the early onset of stratification and the ability of a thin um, surface layer to capture uh, heat fluxes more readily than a deep mixed layer, so if you start early with your capturing of that heat, you're going to get higher by the end of summer. Um, there's good, um, good uh, work being done in this area. So these are, the, um, these are some of the motivations. We want to understand this coupling between physical variability that's obviously quite significant, physical change that's obviously quite significant with its own spatial structure, and biogeochemistry itself. The three areas I want to talk about of work that my group has done in the past several years uh, encompass Lake Superior and Lake Michigan primarily um, in, in detail, and then I'm going to make, uh, 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 at the end, talk about all the Great Lakes in terms of ocean acidification. So in Lake Superior, I want to focus on the spatial heterogeneity of respiration and primary production and how that affects um, both um, uh, the distribution of benthic biomass and the la lake's carbon budget. In Lake Michigan, as you all well know, there's been a large change in productivity in the open waters of the lake, and there's this question of how much is that driven by quagga mussels versus how much is that driven by nutrient change. We're going to use a numerical simulation to separate out those effects and try to attribute the relative importance of those different um, changes in the past several decades. And then last, I want to talk about the potential for ocean acidification and our ability to monitor it given the spatial variability of pH as that couples with our observing system. So, but before I get started, I want to remember to thank the, the PhD and master's students who have really done the lion's share of this work, Val Bennington, Jennifer Phillips, Darren Pilcher, and Lucas Cluggy and funding from the National Science Foundation and the Center for Climatic Research, Climate, People, and the Environment Program at UW-Madison. Okay, so Lake Superior, spatial heterogeneity of respiration and primary production. I want to talk about dipariah biomass distributions and how this might be driven by a net heterotrophy on the slope region uh, as supported by net autotrophy in the near shore. And the, and the transport of net organic matter off of the near shore to the slope. I want to talk about the whole lake carbon budget that also relates to understanding the spatial heterogeneity in respiration. So first, dipariah. As, as many of you are aware, dipariah is a very important part of the food web in the Great Lakes. Um, it's been extirpated from some parts of the lake, but still uh, exists in Lake Superior. 
in, in high abundance. And there's this evidence of uh, much, much work by Marty Auer up at MTU, summarized in his 2013 paper, indicates that the dipariah biomass is really enhanced on the slope. So this um, uh, small plot here shows the bathymetry here with the, uh, the um, right-hand axis, and this is the dipariah biomass, and you can see that it really peaks here in this range of slope, um, where the slope is between 50 and 150 meters water depth. And this is just one of these transects, and in his paper he summarizes across all these many transects, and then comes up with a relationship between dipariah biomass and the bathymetry to map what he calls the ring of fire around the lake, with the black being regions where uh, dipariah biomass should be high based on this correlation between uh, observed um, high biomass and the slope uh, and, the, and the bathymetry. So we see that there's this, this enhanced biomass uh, in this region that is between 55 and 135 meters in his analysis, um, where we have a lot of dipariah. In order for them to exist, what supplies the energy? Is it uh, something going on in the water column? Is it uh, net organic matter being deposited in the benthos and then sliding down onto the slope? There's lots of hypotheses, but it's not yet really clear. And I want to uh, provide some evidence that the water column itself might be part of the support. I'm certainly not trying to tell you that it's all of it, uh, but might be part of the support of the energy for the benthic organisms. We're going to use a coupled hydrodynamic biogeochemical model that should have an animation. Okay, it's starting now. Um, this is an animation uh, of the temperature in the color and the currents in the arrows of Lake Superior uh, over a, a repeating year. Um, here is in the summertime when we see the thermal bar, for example. <clears throat> and into this model, which is a two-kilometer uh, version of the MIT GCM, uh, we've coupled an, an ecosystem that's comparable to what's used in many global ocean models. It has a nutrient, phosphorus is the limiting nutrient, um, and then there are two phytoplankton species, zooplankton, um, DOM and POM. It's coupled to a full carbon cycle model, a full carbon chemistry, and oxygen modules as well. <clears throat> Into this Lake Superior model, we have river inputs of DIC, alkalinity, DOC, and SRP from the nine largest tributaries, encompassing about 60% of the total loads. But, they, but in fact, those loads are a relatively small part of the, the total biogeochemistry in the lake. In the end, most of the lake is internally driven in our findings, but the, the rivers are in there. <clears throat> Okay, so that's our model, and we've, we've looked at this model in the context of uh, a lot of available data. For example, the partial pressure of CO2 and the chlorophyll as estimated by EPA, some uh, in situ PCO2 monitoring that was done in the western arm, and the model does a good job of capturing the observed variability in the biogeochemical uh, parameters that we have access to. Um, I'll just show you one of those validations that we've done, and this is to the kites. Uh, project uh, where we had respiration measurements made off the Keweenaw Peninsula, and this is the HN um, Houghton transect here in 1999 and the Ontonagon transect in, also in 1999. The red are the kites observations at the surface, and there's also purple here, which is a, a five, just below the surface, 5 to 10 meter estimate. And you can see that the model certainly is getting the right, uh, the right magnitude of, of respiration. Um, it's getting, for example, the, uh, the ramping up of, of respiration here occurring um, in, the, um, in the summertime. Uh, and much of the variability also uh, here at the HN transect. It's certainly not getting every point exactly, but the magnitude of variability is certainly consistent with the observations, as is the mean. So we'd really love to have more respiration observations, but there's really not a lot out there. Rate measurements are very hard to come by, both in the Great Lakes and in the Global Oceans. Um, so we're going to use then our numerical model um, based on, you know, and, and say, let's see what we can learn from it, assuming that uh, we've got a pretty good simulation based on the, the comparisons we can make. So this is the uh, respiration in a column integrated respiration across the lake um, in mole, millimole per meter squared per day. And um, you can see that there's a very large variation in respiration from very low values in the very near shore, and that's in part because of very shallow water column, higher respiration rates uh, somewhat offshore, and then very low respiration rates again in the offshore. So that's respiration. Uh, the model also give us 
gives us gross primary production. And so we can look at that pattern and compare the two. And you can see that there's a lot of similarity between them. There's greater GPP on the south shore than on the north shore. It's greater just off the slope than just off the, the coast than in the um, than right on the coast. And then the offshore waters are, are low. Uh, but you really get the, uh, the best picture of this if you make a ratio between the two and look at the RTP. So here, anything that is totally in balance at a single point will have a value of 1. Uh, and anything that is in the blues is going to be um, net heterotrophic, uh, sorry, net um, autotrophic, net autotrophic, where the respiration is less than the production. And anything in the reds is going to be net hot, uh, um, heterotrophic, where we're getting more um, uh, respiration occurring there than production occurring, all right? And so you can see here this pattern of much um, uh, higher production than respiration in the very um, near shore. On the slope, we're getting greater respiration than production. And then in the offshore waters, it's, it's getting closer to balance, although there's still some spatial heterogeneity there. <clears throat> And if I um, then go and average this R to P um, pattern uh, by bathymetry, so if I here going from the, the coast to 50 meters depth, that's the near shore. The next box is the slope from 50 to 150 meters. And then the offshore is anything with a depth of greater than 150 meters. And if I integrate up the, the um, respiration and the GPP in those zones, I find R to P in the near shore is about um, 0.9, or there's about 10% um, you know, more stuff produced than is respired locally. Well, and if I look at the slope region, there's about a 5% excess of respiration, or net heterotrophy, to about, or about 5%. And then the offshore is really quite balanced between the two. <clears throat> Within the rounding error, the R to P is 1. So what we're suggesting here is that we have uh, a lot of production occurring in the, in the near shore, and that happens quickly, creates large gradients, and then the, the hydrodynamics is able to sweep a lot of that uh, phytoplankton biomass or DOC or POC, detrital uh, matter, off onto the slope, and that's where it gets respired, um, and you get more net respiration on the slope than you do um, uh, the, the gross primary productivity productivity occurring in the water column. So this suggests a potential for um, energy supply, net energy supply from the near shore to the slope in the water column that could help to support these communities such as the Dipariya. Again, uh, now we can compare this R to P map to the ring of fire from our and see, for example, that there's quite a bit of correspondence between the two. Um, and uh, and this is this is this is a, this is what we are concluding that there's this this idea this potential for water column transport of organic matter to add to the energy supply for that dipariya. I'd be happy. This is work that we're still working on. I'd be happy to talk to folks who know more about dipariya than I do and learn about uh, how you think this could uh, if you think this is a valid hypothesis. Okay, so that's the dipariya story that I wanted to tell. Um, and I, I, then I wanted to add a little bit more to the respiration uh, story by talking about the Lake Superior carbon budget. Oh. Okay. Um, so uh, in the past decade or so, uh, there's been a, a lot of um, desire to make carbon budgets. Uh, carbon budgets um, uh, for carbon budget for Lake Superior in particular, starting with Cotner 2004. Um, through my paper in 2011, uh, adding up the net, the sum of the inputs and the outputs, and asking, do we have a balanced budget? I mean, if the ba budget isn't balanced, that suggests some of our understanding is off, or we, um, because um, you should have the inputs equal to the outputs, or you have something that's very much a non, not in steady state. So if we add up all our estimates of the inputs, the rivers, the atmospheric deposition, and the GPP, and the losses from the lake of carbon, the efflux, the burial, and the outflow, and the respiration, we find there's a problem because the inputs uh, from these estimates suggest the inputs of carbon are about 7 to 11 teragrams of carbon per year, but the outputs are significantly larger, 17 to 46 teragrams of carbon per year. So uh, this suggests that something is amiss in our understanding of the carbon budget. 
And um, of course, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in all of these, but it is the big guys, um, the GPP and the R, that are the ones that are most likely to drive this difference just because they're of greater magnitude, of course. And we're particularly going to look at this respiration number in, um, in, the stud, in the study. So this is just another view of that respiration. Here I'm using um, volumetric rates and a log scale, so the plot looks a little bit different, but it tells the same story. There's a big variation in respiration rates across space in Lake Superior, at least a factor of 10. And if you look back at the studies, uh, before we had an understanding of this kind of spatial uh, variability, they used only a factor of two with respect to those observations off the Keweenaw to make an extrapolation to the whole lake. Lacking any better information, we kind of knew that, that um, the respiration would be lower in the offshore, and a factor of two was sort of, okay, well, let's use that. But if we actually look at this map, we have much greater variation. So if we simply use the pattern from the model, this averaged over five years pattern from the model, and reference that to the observations, uh, we, we get a much lower integrated respiration in the lake, um, about um, five to six teragrams of carbon per year. And if we plug that into our um, budget, we can now budget the inputs and the outputs of Lake Superior. So understanding the spatial variability is not just about understanding the difference between here and there, it's also about being able to put um, the whole lake into the context of you know, whether the lake is on the whole net heterotrophic or net autotrophic, whether the lake on the whole is emitting carbon or taking it up. So spatial variability comes in, again, as an important factor. So my conclusions for Lake Superior then, um, we find that organic matter produced in the near shore can offer some energy subsidy to the slope, and that might help support these diapariah uh, distributions. And we also find that the lake-wide carbon budget can be balanced if the spatial heterogeneity in respiration as estimated by our numerical simulations is included in that extrapolation of data to the whole lake scale. All right, now I'm going to move on to Lake Michigan uh, productivity changes in the past several decades. So as you all, of course, are well aware, there's been this significant decadal change in Lake Superior uh, production. This is the phytoplankton production from Fahan et al. 2010 in, with the spring mixing um, uh, here in the 80, 83 to 87, 95 to 98, and 2007, 2008. This enormous decline, um, a couple times decline in, in the total amount of production occurring in the spring. Uh, also, if we just look at May, uh, big declines. However, during the mid-stratification, that productivity largely recovers, and at late stratification, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between these productivity levels. It's slightly lower, but it's, um, but it's much less significant than early on. So what drives this? Uh, and, and certainly there's been a lot of work looking at the effect of quagga mussels as a likely driver because they are able to filter when the lake is overturning, they're able to access the water column and take out the phytoplankton. And that mechanism is definitely what we find to be important uh, here, and we look at it at, uh, across the whole lake in the numerical model. So we've built a similar numerical model as we have for Superior, for Lake Michigan, again, MIT GCM at two kilometer resolution. And this is a Hobmuller diagram of time going uh, from the bottom up. Oh, and I'm doing it on here, not on here, sorry. <laughs> um, from the bottom up, so 2008, June is here uh, through the end of the observing season, then May 2009 through October 2009. And, and the, on, the, on the left here is the lake surface temperature, on the right is the observed uh, from this Lake Express transect run by Harvey Bootsma at UW-Milwaukee. And so the point is that the model is getting a very good seasonal um, variability in the lake surface temperature and also is able to capture, for example, in August, this upwelling driven cooling um, on the western shore, uh, which is a stark contrast to the much warmer waters on the eastern shore. And that's very consistent with the observed here. Um, so we think the model is doing a pretty good job of the physics. And into that model, again, we couple some biogeochemistry. This biogeochemistry is similar to what we had in Lake Superior, slightly modified um, to, to represent the observations better in Lake um, Michigan, including adding a silica cycle that improves our simulation of the diatoms. 
So uh, this is what we call the pre-quagga biogeochemistry. So we don't have quagga mussels in the model here. And so it would be appropriate to compare that model to the gross primary production observed at the NOAA time series sites here um, in the 80s and the, and the 90s. And that's the gross primary production plot here, where the observations are the black symbols and the, obser and, and the model is the, the trace. And we can see that the model does a good job of capturing the observed cycle of productivity, although it does seem like the May peak is probably a bit too high in the model here, um, although not formally inconsistent with the observations given the uncertainties, uh, both uh, at temporal variability and the um, uncertainty in the translation between net primary productivity and GPP. <clears throat> Uh, the model has, um, is dominated by diatoms, that's the biomass here, plot, that's definitely the big player with the small phytoplankton playing a smaller role and the zooplankton, uh, since they take longer to reproduce and grow, having a slower uh, catch up to the spring bloom. This model um, uh, uh, tells, gives us an idea of how um, the chlorophyll and, and carbon uh, are related across the lake. Um, that was the main subject of this paper by Darren Pilcher as a lead author in JGR in 2015. So this is just a map of the chlorophyll seasonality and the PCO2 seasonality or the partial pressure of CO2 on the bottom. And just to note that they're largely in any correlation between chlorophyll and PCO2. So we have high PCO2 when uh, the lake is cold and mixing, bringing up the respiration products from the previous year, um, and a low productivity at that time. And then lower PCO2 around the edges here in winter when we are having some production in the lake. And then we have the spring bloom, which draws down PCO2. And then we move into the summertime when the production in the lake is lower, ex except for in this um, western side of the basin, we see this upwelling driven bloom that is not occurring in the east. And the PCO2 is also responding to that uh, pattern. And, and so this is the, this is the seasonality uh, from, from the model. Okay, so this is sort of the base model or control model. And now we want to ask our question, how have quagga mussels versus nutrient loading changed the productivity in recent decades? So as you're all aware, we've had this invasion of the quaggas. This is the Nalpidol traces showing this enormous growth of the quaggas since the early 2000s. And that's uh, you know, going to have some significant impacts on productivity uh, based on a lot of evidence. At the same time, however, we have, because of um, water quality controls, we have been reducing the phosphorus loading to the lake. So therefore, our phosphorus concentrations are going down. And both of those are going to have the effect of reducing production. So we'd like to be able to separate those two major effects to understand the total effect on the production in the lake. So in order to get at this, we've added uh, quagga mussels to the numerical model. These mussels graze in the bottom model layer. They're essentially like another zooplankton that just sits on the bottom. And they filter um, at a rate of 225 milliliters per mussel per hour. And uh, the densities are from the NALPA maps 2010 and 2014. So we add those mussels. And then we're going to do um, several uh, sensitivity experiments. So we start with our control our control that I've showed you before, no, qua uh, no quagga mussels and the past nutrient concentration, where the past nutrient concentrations were from the 80s at uh, 6.8 uh, for phosphorus and silica of 0.7 milligram per liter. And these are based on the observations. And this is the initial condition at the start of the model run is that value. So we don't explicitly have rivers putting this in. We just start the model with either a high or a lower nutrient concentration consistent with these different levels. OK, so our, our control has the past nutrients and no quaggas. And our present has the with the quaggas and with the present nutrients, which are um, about 3 microgram per liter for phosphorus and silica 0.8. And then we can also do the one or the other, where we have either with quaggas and the past nutrients and no quaggas and the present nutrients to begin to say which is more important. And this, uh, these changes both have significant effects on the spatial pattern of productivity and on the timing of the productivity, as I will show you. OK, so first, um, our no quaggas with the past nutrients, our control experiment. 
This is the one that, that I showed you before, although here I'm going to show you the NPP, the phytoplankton biomass, and the zooplankton. You can see um, you can see that pattern. For example, in NPP, we have higher NPP integrated across the year on the um, western side of the basin where we get that upwelling driven continued productivity over the summer season. <clears throat> And then this is the present where both of the effects have been put in on the same color bar. So going back and forth between those two a couple times, you can see this dramatic loss of NPP, this dramatic reduction in phytoplankton biomass, and also dramatic losses in zooplankton biomass. If I then compare this present model to the observations at the station uh, for 07 and 08 from Fachenseel, um, these are the observations. There's actually a couple observations over here in early spring. These are the very low values, also very low in May that the model doesn't capture very well, and then the rest of the year. So the model does have this very high bloom occurring in May, which is, is almost certainly too high, uh, but the integrated production compared to the observations is good, um, and so will, um, and, and the fact that the model pulls down the production to this level here in spring is also critical. All right, so we think the model does a good job of the total, and now we want to separate those two pieces, as I mentioned before. So going back to the control experiment, I showed this slide before, and now I'm going to show only the percent change in these patterns with these different experiments here. So first, I'm going to only change to the present nutrient concentrations and not add quaggas yet. So these are uh, percent changes from the control. Uh, where the blues are, you know, 0 to 30 percent change, and the light blues are going 40 to 50, and reds are 100 percent. So you can see here that we get a kind of a homogenous pattern of reduction in NPP, phytoplankton, and zooplankton from the change in the um, nutrient concentrations. I mean, that, and this is sensible. The, that effect is felt everywhere by all phytoplankton, and they go down kind of um, largely in a homogenous pattern. If I only add the quaggas and keep the past nutrients, the pattern is quite different. Uh, here we get very large reductions in the near shore and much smaller reductions of NPP, phytoplankton, and zooplankton in the offshore. Um, and this is largely because it's the near shore where the um, quaggas are sitting higher up in the water column, where they're more likely to be in contact uh, during uh, with, the, um, with the surface uh, productivity, and they're able to really draw down that phytoplankton productivity very effectively. We see changes of up to 100% uh, in the nearshore regions everywhere with the quagga mussels. And if I put the two together, uh, both changing the prep nutrients and changing the quagga mussels, I see um, that it's not, not precisely the sum of the two because there are nonlinear interactions, of course, but it is largely the sum of the two where the nutrients are largely driving down the NPP pattern as a whole, but it is the, zo it is the, um, uh, the grazing by the, uh, the, the quagga that is really driving the nearshore reductions um, dominantly. There's also significant seasonal differences in the effects of these two, as you would expect. The previous maps were just annual. Here I'm showing all four experiments uh, here on a line plot. Okay, so here the control is the solid black line. Um, the uh, just um, changing the nutrients is the dashed black line. So the black doesn't include quaggas, and the gray does include quaggas. So if I just add quaggas, I get the solid gray line, and if I change both, I get the dash gray line. So key change here, for example, is that if you add the quaggas, you kill the spring bloom. And that's very consistent with our observations. What is interesting to note is that when you um, is, is that the if you add the quaggas, say here you're the solid um, uh, black versus the solid gray. If you have the quaggas here, you actually get a larger later bloom because you have the quaggas because there's a lot of leftover nutrients still re still in the water column when stratification occurs that the, that the phytoplankton are able to get because those nutrients haven't been used earlier in the bloom. So you get an overshoot of the bloom because of the existence of the quaggas uh, in our model. And, and then the other interesting thing to note is that by the end, largely um, the um, effect of the quaggas is lost. So there's little difference after about June between whether you have 
the um, quaggas on or not. Uh, it's, the bigger difference there is made by the nutrients. And there's a little bit of that effect of the quaggas comes back late in the, late in the year. But in the stratified season, largely the quaggas are not having an effect. And that is sensible given that they're largely removed from contact with the phytoplankton. So conclusions on Lake Michigan, this part of the talk, um, is that the quagga mussels strongly impact the near shore production in particular, and they do this particularly in winter and spring, but have less of a year-round effect. If we look at the integrated GPP, the quaggas don't have a very much of a very large effect. Much bigger to the whole lake GPP is the effect of the changing nutrients, um, and those numbers are given in the in the paper. <clears throat> and so a nutrient change is what really reduces the production everywhere, although with a much more spatially um, homogeneous uh, pattern. And this effect is large, lar much larger on the year round. So for example, we see this large decline in production here between the black uh, solid and the black dashed um, is, is that's the bigger total change in GPP in, by our estimates. Okay, the last uh, topic I want to raise is that of ocean acidification in the Great Lakes. So as I'm sure you're aware, um, we're putting carbon in the atmosphere, and that goes into the water, and when you add carbon to water, it acidifies the water. And this is very clearly being seen in the global oceans. If we look at all the ocean time series, um, seven ocean time series uh, by Bates et al., 2014 in oceanography, we see declines everywhere in the global ocean pH. In 2010, NOAA produced the Oceans and Great Lake Acidification Plan, which was the first time that the Great Lakes as um, a, a, a place where acidification should be happening was really mentioned in the, in the available literature and, um, and raised the question of, you know, how much are the lakes acidifying? Could, can we tell if there were trends uh, like in the ocean? And, um, and, uh, and then, of course, if there were trends, what would the effects be would be the next question. So we've been looking into this. Um, and, and the first place is a question of whether the lakes, um, and we're particularly focused on Superior and Michigan in our study here, show uh, whether the lakes are really driven by the atmospheric CO2. Is there, is there a, uh, a, a largely an equilibration between the lakes and the atmosphere, uh, which would suggest that as the atmospheric PCO2 goes up, the, the lake PCO2 should also go up. And if the PCO2 goes up, the basic chemistry tells us that the pH goes down. So the evidence is, yes, that, the, that Lake Superior and Michigan, at least, are near e equilibrium with atmospheric PCO2 when you integrate over the year. There's certainly variations around that mean, uh, no doubt, um, due to biological productivity and physical variability. But when you integrate over the year, the, the, the PCO2 lands around the atmospheric. So what I'm showing here is from Attil et al. 2011 in LNO, where we looked at uh, a uh, in situ instrument that measured uh, every 30 minutes the PCO2 of Lake Superior here at Split Rock uh, for a couple months in 2001. This is the atmosphere from a nearby tower. And these are the EPA estimates here of the PCO2 that are um, consistent with the in situ observations. And you can see that even though the record is certainly short, the PCO2 of the lake is largely around the atmosphere. There is this big um, decline, which seems to be an upwelling driven bloom drawing down DIC. If we look at Lake Michigan, uh, both with observations and with the model, we do find that the integrated CO2 flux uh, suggests also emission in the springtime and uptake um, in the in the in the summertime, largely a balance, uh, 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 which suggests the PCO2 of the atmosphere is uh, largely what sets the mean PCO2 of the lakes. So taking that, um, uh, the lake PCO2 then should follow atmospheric PCO2. If atmospheric PCO2 goes up to 500, that level at which the lake is equilibrating to should go up to 500. Um, and that means that the primary mechanism for ocean acidification or CO2 acidification should occur. So if that happens, uh, what would the pH do in the lakes? This is using well-known chemistry, freshwater chemistry, what you have in CO2 cysts, for example. And it tells us that if atmospheric PCO2 goes up, if that's the dominant control on pH, uh, and this is just a simple calculation here, 
that the lakes will acidify at the same rate as the surface ocean. Salinity makes a little bit of difference in the carbon chemistry in, in water, but not much. These rates are essentially the same as you'd see in the ocean, about a 0.3 decline by 2100 over the present under high emission scenarios. What we're showing here are the five different lakes, with, and the color bar is, um, is over here. This is Superior, for example. This is Michigan. It is their alkalinities that sets the different uh, mean pH, uh, but the, the slopes are all the same. If we warm the lakes quite a lot, we get a little bit of mitigation of the pH trend, but not very much, and the scenario matters also. Um, these are somewhat older scenarios, but largely consistent with what we now call RCP 8.5. Okay, so I'm going to go forward from here. All right. Um, so the question then I'm going to ask is, uh, you know, this is this is a very simple projection that you can run on your Excel in your Excel, right? So um, could the available data identify such trends to determine if they are occurring is really the critical question. Are these trends happening? Can we see them? Um, or do we need to do um, different observations in order to observe them? Okay, so the, that leads us to the question of how much does pH actually vary in the Great Lakes? We don't have good observations of this, but our numerical models with a full uh, carbon system can, can illustrate pH variability across the lakes. So this is at, at the pH of 15th of April 2008 in our simulation, and you can see that in the regions where the bloom is occurring at that time, you have relatively high pH because carbon is being drawn down by the biology. And in the offshore regions where we have, um, where we're not yet in bloom, we have uh, much lower pHs because the PCO2 is higher. And then on top of this, I've put the EPA observation sites. And so you can certainly see just from this visual comparison that those sites aren't necessarily going to capture all of this pH variability um, in, in Lake Michigan. And we want to look at this in, um, in detail. But first we want to say, okay, well, those are the sites we have. Let's look at the available observations and take into account the spatial heterogeneity that they do observe as well as measurement uncertainty and estimate what the pH is of uh, Lake Michigan and how it's changed over the years. Okay, so this is the mean of the 11 um, April and 11 August samples from the surface. Uh, in, uh, from the EPA observations from 86 to 2001, and we're including the spatial variability across those 11 stations, as well as the measurement uncertainty um, as estimated from uh, replicate samples. And you can see uh, that the uncertainty bounds are on the order of 0.2 to 0.4 pH units, plus or minus, and um, uh, if we couple with this, that chemistry-only projection, um, for my simple model, you can see that that projection certainly falls within the uncertainty bounds from the observations, and you cannot, uh, you cannot validate or invalidate the hypothesis that such a trend is occurring given the uncertainty on these observations. That is due both to measurement and spatial heterogeneity. There's an even more fundamental question here that we need to ask, which is whether April and August represents the annual mean pH of the lakes. It is certainly quite possible that some of these April samples that are included in these averages across April and August, some of those Aprils were already in bloom. Some of them might not have been in bloom yet. And so we need to ask, um, uh, is the whole lake annual pH well approximated by the EPA April and August sampling? So we do here an, an, what we call an observing system simulation experiment with our numerical model. We take our model, we observe it as the EPA observations were collected, and this is all in model world, but we're testing the sampling. How well is the sampling able to represent the full model, essentially, is the question. And so we show here the blue is the sampled model with one standard deviation spatially. I haven't included any measurement uncertainty because in the model there is no measurement uncertainty. And uh, the black is the full model averaged over all points in each year, all points in space and time. And it is certainly great that the, the full model is, the full model or full annual estimate is captured within the uncertainty of those April, August uh, combined estimates. But if you want to look at the trends, you don't have a very good estimate here. 
because the uh, the full model is going is basically flat and then goes up while the there's a continual rise in the sampled model and we, we only have four years of simulation here because of computational constraints would really like to do this over a longer period uh, but it certainly does suggest that the EPA sampling is not doing a very good job of capturing the annual mean pH of the lakes and therefore we really can't test the hypothesis that uh, OA ocean acidification is occurring or invalidate that hypothesis that it say it's not occurring in the Great Lakes. So is OA happening in the Great Lakes? The well understood chemistry indicates acidification should be happening. And this is a huge area of research in the global oceans and within NOAA. An enormous amount of work is being done in this area. Uh, and what we know is that it should be happening in the Great Lakes, but the reality is our current monitoring couldn't identify a trend if it were occurring. And so we really need pH data at greater spatial and temporal resolution in order to begin to evaluate this hypothesis. Um, and there are uh, more autonomous systems and volunteer observing ship programs that are occurring that could be implemented in the Great Lakes uh, at relatively low cost, certainly on no cost, uh, but that could begin to evaluate pH trends uh, if, if we were able to get uh, over some of that spatial and temporal variability that is clearly happening in the lakes but is not fully observed. Okay, so that brings me to my conclusions. Uh, for the whole talk. In Lake Superior, we find that organic matter produced in the near shore can offer an energy subsidy to the slope and potentially is an energy source for the benthic biomass. We find that the lake-wide carbon budget can be balanced if spatial heterogeneity and respiration is taken into account. In Lake Michigan, we find that the quagga mussels strongly impact near shore production in particular, and particularly in the spring, uh, the winter and spring, really killing that spring bloom but that it's nutrient change that reduces production everywhere and has a greater effect on the year-round total GPP of the lake. And finally, we make the case that OA is likely in the Great Lakes uh, based on our understanding of what's going on in the ocean and our understanding to date of the carbon cycle of the lakes. However, the pH monitoring is not currently sufficient in order to look at these trends. And so there's some work that needs to be done to begin to, to look and evaluate that hypothesis uh, in the years coming forward. So uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take your questions. Microphone is coming. I want you to use the microphone for the people on online. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious about the ocean acidification story. I know paradoxically pH in some rivers is in uh, increasing, particularly the Mississippi, how does river loading uh, uh, play a role in uh, basins like um, Michigan? Right. Yeah, very good question. So um, the, what we've, we've looked at this not in Lake Michigan, we have looked at it in Lake Superior, looked at the river loading there. And we find that it's only that the PCO2 effects of river loading is actually very, very localized to the rivers and that quickly dissipates away from the river mouth. And that um, relatively um, close to the river mouth, you return to a place where the lake pH and lake PCO2 is largely set by the atmosphere. Um, but, but I have not looked at that in detail in Lake Michigan, and you can imagine that particularly if you go down to Lake Erie, it might be even more important, right? So, um, yeah, you know, Lake Superior would be on Precambrian Shield, which would mm -hmm. be a pretty acidic uh, system. Yes, yes, and that affects, that's the background alkalinity story here, and that's why if we look at these um, traces, the mean pH here and the mean um, uh, is much lower and superior than Michigan, but the trends are the same. Now, would changing river loading because of you know, global warming or changing in um, you know, precipitation, how would that feed into the story? Really good questions, and clearly the full pH change in the lakes is not is probably, particularly in lakes that are more affected by the landscape, it's probably not exclusively going to be driven by the atmosphere, but it, it's probably, um, it, but it's definitely something we should be looking at. And we might find that there are declines in pH in Superior and Michigan, but less so in the other lakes because of these mitigating factors. These are exactly the proposals that I've been writing in the past several years, and I'm looking forward to find, finally getting funding at some point to look at them in, uh, in detail as they should be considered. First, a disclaimer, not a chemist. Um, you've got the miniature version of the, the figure that I'm interested in yeah, here. Um, so you're talking about 
these being numbers for pH that are in in balance with the uh, atmospheric CO2. Yes. Um, and I guess I want to understand a little bit more about the the difference between the lakes here is that largely temperature dependent? It's and alkalinity. So the alkalinity is the charge balance of the lake, uh, which is set by the major ions such as calcium chlorine, for example, in the lakes, and and that is what determines the uh, the the background balance of carbonate versus bicarbonate in the water. Sets the mean PCO2, and it also sets the pH. So this is a uh, you know, and this al the alkalinity is something that's observed by EPA. It's pretty well known that it's much higher in the lakes except for Superior, about um, 2,000 in those lakes, about 800, 900 in Superior. I'm going to jump back to the mussel story. Sure. In, in your model, is the effect of the mussels on productivity primarily a direct effect on the phytoplankton, or is it via um, removal of phosphorus in the water? so that the phytoplankton can get to it. It's a direct effect on the phytoplankton. They eat the phytoplankton. If they come in contact with it, they can, they graze it down. Okay. So it does, doesn't consider the possibility then that the mussels may be actually removing phosphorus before the, the phytoplankton ever get to it. No, it does not include that possibility. In fact, the phosphorus is then recycled to the water column as it's removed from the organic matter. So it's turned into DOC and POC. Um, but yeah, this is another, uh, it, you know, there's not a benthic um, uh, module in this model, uh, and so those, as we discussed in the paper, are additional effects that really should be considered. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions, and a muscle question and a certification question. The muscle question is, uh, is the uh, the study that you've done in Lake Superior, does that inform something about uh, the collapse of diapariya in the other lakes? So, for example, the, the, uh, the co-location of quagga mussels in what would have been the uh, historical ring of fire in Lake Michigan, uh, is that causal or coincidence? Yeah, that's a great question. Certainly not one that I've looked at. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I can't, I, I can't answer that, but I'd be happy to talk more about it. Um, yeah, it's not something, it's not the, the, I've not looked at the respiration pattern as it changes. We could with the model, we could do the same analysis, but it's not something I've done. It's a great question. Uh, moving into speculation then, would you expect the same processes to be operating near shore export into the kind of uh, slope regions in Lake Michigan? Yeah, I mean, in, in the I I would because let me just go back here to this plot of control. Right. So basically, as you see here, that we're getting our if we have more production occurring in the it, really near the shore, uh, that means you're creating large gradients in the water column of. POC, uh, whether that be live or dead, uh, of organic matter, right? And then you have hydrodynamics that is constantly mixing across those gradients. So it's going to be sweeping whatever's got, whatever we've got on the coast off into the slope regions and off to the offshore. And since those things um, are going to take some time to remineralize, uh, you're going to have some sort of a subsidy. But quantitatively, yeah, I should, I will, I, that's a great idea. I should look at that and be able to compare and contrast what's going on in Michigan and Superior and across these different simulations. That'd be a great a great thing to look at, how that's changed. Um, I'm, I'm sure the competing uh, schools of diaparia collapse would be interesting. Great. Um, the, the acidification question is, uh, given that there's some kind of an investment in, in observing to document it, uh, is there any justification in it, in, in the lakes, given that you don't have uh, coral reefs and scallops and pteropods and other things that people care about in the ocean? Well, I mean, we do have, I mean, so I think there's, yes, we've, we've actually looked at this a little bit in terms of an expert elicitation on what would the effects be on, um, on, on stuff in the lake. And it, most of the experts that we um, interviewed uh, suggested that it would be questions of, of, of mussels. Because uh, even the, I mean, this actually acidification could help with the with the quagga and zebra mussels because their veligers don't like the low pH, right? So that that's one possibility. Um, but also juvenile fish is another area that increasingly in the ocean people are learning 
are strongly affected, at least some species that have been looked at have been strongly affected by um, changing uh, acidification, so a changing uh, pH. So, I mean, I, you know, as, as uh, NSF is moving to with the question of OA, it's not just one stressor, but it's multiple stressors. It's temperature changing, it's uh, acidification, it's all, and changing nutrient loads and everything else. And I agree with you that it might be that in certain lakes, the effect of OA is not uh, a dominant one, not the, the primary concern. But, um, I mean, we should be understanding if the changes are happening because there might be things that are affected by it uh, and put, be able to put it into the context of multiple stressors. All right, well, it sounds like that's it. Thanks, everyone, for coming, and I look forward to meeting with some of you later in the day.